a shift in psychology and national character. Psychology is defined here as the field of the study of psychological ideas derived from the traditional thoughts of people. National psychology refers to the, actual or perceived, distinctive psychological makeup of particular countries slash nations, ethnic groups, or peoples, and, to the comparative study of those characteristics in social psychology, sociology, political science, and anthropology. The perception of national psychology is that different ethnic groups, or the people living in a particular country, are characterized by a distinctive mix of attitudes, values, emotions, motivation, and abilities which is culturally reinforced by language, religion, the family, schooling, the state, and the media. The psychology here refers to a system-slash-school of psychology derived from classical thinking rooted in psychologically relevant practices, such as yoga, prevalent in the Indian subcontinent for centuries. This psychoanalysis of the populace is not a Western transplant neglecting the indigenous traditions, ethos, and concurrent community conditions. Attention was afforded to specific psychological processes and constructs, such as values, personality, perception, cognition, emotion, creativity, education, and spirituality, and applications to individual psychology and group dynamics, including meditation practices from different traditions, like yoga, Ayurveda, and Islamic rituals. After the end of colonial eras and the forced creation of the Indian Union, a psychological transformation set in almost the entire continent which, though scantily investigated and documented, was inevitable and of utmost significance in the context of future evolutionary processes of new nations-slash-countries thus emerged. Many types of research have taken place targeting the somatic and depressive symptoms among Asian patients, from India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh, compared with Caucasian people, concluding that sociocultural factors interact with the risk factors contributing to the overall psychology, including depression. Poverty and joblessness are known factors to intensify a sense of failure in certain cultures, ultimately leading to an overall psychological transformation or reconstruction. I have observed that deprivation, poverty, and neglect not only transform the individual and group psychologically, but also transform the overall physicality of the populace, such as limb functionality like the movement of hands, and spacing of fingers, facial features, especially mouth reflexive movements, becoming a poster of all these devastating effects of the recent past or generational past. Such internalized transformations, even after a positive change in the circumstances of these people, take several generations to go away and restore their psychology, physicality, and features back to normal. The national character of a nation-slash-country refers to the values, norms, and customs that people typically hold, internalized, their typical emotional responses, and what they regard as virtue and vice, all factors which shape their habituated responses in a given situation. However, the discussion in this treatise is centered around the psychological transformation of a country as a nation, in a comparative sense. Note. Historical events in this piece are used only to show their derivative and indelible effects on the psychology of the people. Although, before the post-colonial transformation, another transformation had already been perpetuated by foreign invasions, regional and local rivalries, and internecians over a long period of history, which rendered the continental populace submissive, poverty-ridden, illiterate, and depressed. Upon close observation, one would find, that an overall atmosphere of doom and gloom has been cast upon the entire population. A liking for sad songs and tragic movies and living a life prone to tragedies became a norm. A love for the sad songs and guzzles seemed to provide a glimpse of hope and solace, envisaging the love of a woman trapped in the same vicious circle the lover is. An inevitable cause has been the sad songs and guzzles' continual tearing down of the social and cultural fabrics of the continent due to infighting, internecians, invasions, and subjugations. A factor that, by and large, kept the populace yet intact and survived was its non-displacement, with few exceptions. To keep from being bogged down in the morasses of history, I am deliberately resorting to historical brevity. Gerrymandering of the region. India. Indian continent had been going through transitions from 4500 BCE, from Indus Valley civilization to Vedic period from 1500 to 500 BCE evolving Varna system into Hindu caste system. Chieftaincies, Janapadas, consolidated into larger states, Mahajanapadas. Urbanization gave rise to ascetic mythologies, like Jainism and Buddhism, countering the Brahmanism influence and the primacy of the rituals. A synthesis of Vedic Brahmanism with the pre-existing religions of the continent, compelled by the success of the above-mentioned ascetic mythologies, gave rise to Hinduism. The tripartite movement lasted for two centuries. Between the 7th and 11th centuries, many royal powers took root. The Kola dynasty invaded Maldives, Sri Lanka, and Bengal. 
limited Islamic inroads happened in Sindh and Afghanistan in the 8th century. Then, in 1206 CE Ghaznavi dynasty was established, which started declining in the late 14th century. The Sultanate of Bengal was a powerful kingdom that lasted for three centuries. The 15th century then saw the rise of Sikhism. This period also saw the emergence of several powerful Hindu states, such as Vihayanagar and Rajput states. The Mughal Empire of the 16th century that conquered most of the continent is known as the early modern period of its history. Industrialization morphed the continent into global economic power. Its GDP increased to one quarter of the total world GDP when the continent was known as the Golden Sparrow. The Mughals, nevertheless, faced a decline in the 18th century that resulted in the rise of Marathas, Sikhs, Nizams, and Nawabs ruling most of the continent. 18th and 19th centuries then saw the dominance of East India Company until the revolt of 1957. British India Empire was partitioned in 1947 by granting independence to the fabricated Indian Union and the state of Pakistan. Indian populace throughout its history, for the most part, remained under one or the other form of subjugation. The psychological transformation within the fabricated Indian Union could very well be understood by reading the articles appended below. On the one hand, submissiveness slash obedience became a commonplace character of the populace. On the other, however, there remains kindling but the dismal urge for freedom. The result is that even after 75 years of occupation slash subjugation, none of the numerous active secessionist movements has succeeded. Greater than insatiably expansionist India. Greater than Mikhail Gorbachev of India. Pakistan. Pakistan was grudgingly accorded independence in 1947. Pakistan became a brand new state with a clean slate to write its own history. A mass migration, on the one hand, where, played havoc producing dreadful memories, on the other, it pushed the historical clutter into oblivion due to the fondness and exuberance for freedom. Pakistanis braced numerous bumps, thus ultimately shaping their psychology independent of direct and domineering Indian influence. Due to Pakistan's historical, geographical position, and ethnic diversity, its culture has become a melting pot of Indian, Persian, Afghan, Central Asian, South Asian, Western Asian, Middle Eastern, and Western influences. The most remarkable thing that happened was the sense of absolute freedom without a fear of interference or subjugation, which minorities still face in the fabricated Indian Union. This sense of freedom and success of carving out their own Muslim-dominated country helped them develop in a unique way than the rest of the rustic and centuries-old entrenched into civilizations. The recollection of socio-economic, political, and technologically significant events and the environment in which this happened during their coming-of-age era. It impacted the formation of the Y generation of Pakistanis endowed with unique characteristics such as physique, mentality, diet, culinary, and complexion. Pakistan, at present, according to a study based on Schumann and Scott's 1989 model, is inhabited by three distinct Pakistani generational cohorts, as Pakistani Baby Boomer Generation, Pakistani Generation X, and Pakistani Millennial Slash Generation Y that currently comprise the workforce of Pakistan. The first generation is almost gone, with only a few remaining. The second generation X has a mix of a few direct or indirect memories. The third generation, Y has no first-hand exposure or memories, thus evolving as free souls without historical encumbrance. This is moderately nationalistic, religious, self-confident, and eager to excel. This is the very generation that is the core constituency of second-generation iconoclast Imran Khan. The importance of the province of Punjab, the second-largest and most developed housing of 60% of the country, cannot be overemphasized. Pakistanis, in the view of some biosociological sources, are the most handsome and intelligent, initially started from being, rather street-smart or even evil genius, people in entire South Asia, trekking fast towards maturity and civility. The Pakistanis, in terms of the above assessment, despite having hit so many snags like several military unwarranted takeovers and plundering, political opportunism, and economic mismanagement, are destined to be the first South Asian people to join the ranks of developed countries. Bangladesh Bangladesh was formerly East Pakistan, which seceded due to political injustice meted out to Bengali people by the power-hungry politician and control-freak military in cahoots. The Bengalis are industrious and intelligent people like most coast dwellers consuming fish and rice as their staple diet. The Bengalis, in general, are nationalistic and clannish in their behavior. In Bangladesh, anthropological studies among the urban poor have described specific lay terms to describe emotional distress, such as chinta rog, worry illness, and associated it with various physical and emotional stresses and existential conditions of the entire society. Bangladesh is a fast-developing economy, better many times than Pakistan. 
Bengalis, as opposed to their West Pakistani counterparts, are intellectually and geographically stymied by cultural baggage and Indian influence, and the monsoon caused floods. The delta plain of the Ganges, Padma, Brahmaputra, Jamuna, and Meghna rivers and their tributaries occupy 79% of the country. Bangladesh has a tropical monsoon climate characterized by heavy seasonal rainfall, high temperatures, and high humidity. Natural disasters such as floods and cyclones accompanied by the periodical storm surge negatively affect and keep the country from developing. They may, however, most likely overtake their South Indian counterparts, such as Goans, Madrasis, Malabaris, and Sri Lankans, mainly due to poverty alleviation. Iran The Islamic Republic of Iran, formerly known to the Western world as Persia until 1935, is a country with a proud and intricate ancient history. Almost all Iranian philosophers, such as Farabi, Ghazali, and Avicenna, have paid attention to psychological issues, such as perception, sensation, mood, memory, and cognition, from a philosophical viewpoint. The Arab invasion of Iran resulted in a break from the past that affected not only Iran but all of Western Asia and resulted in the assimilation of peoples who shaped and vitalized Muslim culture the advent of Islam, 640-829. The vulnerability of Sasani in Iran assisted the expansionist process. In 623, the Byzantine emperor Heraclius reversed Persian successes over Roman arms, by capturing Jerusalem in 614 and winning at Chalcedon in 617. His victim, Khosrau Parviz, died in 628 and left Iran prey to a succession of puppet rulers who were deposed frequently by a combination of nobles and Zoroastrian clergy. The former Arab vassals' raids into the Sasanian territory were quickly taken over by Muslim caliphs, Abu Bekr and Umar ibn al-Khattab, for it to become a Muslim, pan-Arab control of Iran. Arab victory at al-Qadiziyah in 636-637, was followed by the sacking of the Sasanian winter capital at Tesiphon on the Tigris. The Battle of Nahavand in 642 completed the Sasanian vanquishment. The Sasanian end was ignominious, but it was not the end of Iran. It ushered in a new beginning. In the next two centuries, Iranian civilization was revived with a cultural amalgam, with the patterns of art and thought, with attitudes and a sophistication that was indebted to its pre-Islamic Iranian heritage, a heritage changed but with the infusion of life afresh by the Arab Muslim conquest. A lesser time, therefore, was needed for a new Islamic beginning the Abu Muslim movement which began in Khorasan in 747 and resulted in Arab-Iranian assimilation in colonized regions. Iranians who converted to Islam and became clients, or Mawali, of Arab patrons played direct and indirect parts in the revolutionary movement. The movement also involved Arabs who had become partners with Khorasani and Transoxiana Iranians in ventures in Great East-West trade and inner-city trade of northeastern Iran. The revolution was, nevertheless, primarily an Arab-Islamic movement that intended to supplant a militaristic, tyrannical central government. Umaway dynasty, seated in Damascus, gets destroyed in the year 750, and the revolution paved the way for the Abbasids dynasty. A revolution that established the Abbasid dynasty represented a triumph of the Islamic Hejazi elements within the empire, the Iranian revival was yet to come. Abbasid concern with fostering Eastern Islam made the new caliphs willing to borrow the methods and procedures of statecraft employed by their Iranian predecessors. Umayyads, on the other hand, had imitated Sasanian court etiquette. Baghdad's Persianizing influences went deeper and stoked some resentment among the Arabs, who were nostalgic for the legendary simplicity of human relations among the desert Arabs of yore. Guards of old traditions, fully conscious of the risks of losing, despite being grown in a new metropolis, were determined to represent and preserve the inherent competitive characteristics of the Arabs and Persians. To counter the widespread Arab chauvinism, that persisted after the Abbasid Revolution, there arose a literary political movement known as the Shu'ubiya, which celebrated the excellence of non-Arab Muslims, particularly the Persians, and set the stage for the resurgence of Iranian literature and culture in the decades to come. Respect for poetry, the Arabs' vehicle of folk memory, increased, and minds and imaginations sharpened. Philosophical inquiry developed out of the need for precision about the meaning of holy writ and for the establishment of the authenticity of the Prophet's dicta, collected as hadith, sayings traditionally ascribed to him and recollected and preserved for posterity by his companions. An amalgam, known as Islamic civilization, was thus forged in Baghdad in the 8th and 9th centuries. Persian intellectualism played a conspicuous part in what was still an Arab milieu. The wisdom of the ancient East and modern West was well received and discussed in the schools of Baghdad. This cosmopolitanism was not new to the descendants of the urban Arabs of Mecca or the Iranians, whose land lay across the routes from the Pacific to the Mediterranean. Both the people knew how to purge what was not their own and present what was purely Islamic. 
Islam had liberated men of the scribal and mercantile classes who in Iran had been subject to the dictates of a taboo-ridden and excessively ritualized Zoroastrianism and influenced by Arabian tribalism and prejudices. Sistan, the southeastern border area of Iran, had a tradition of chivalry. As the ancient homeland of Iranian military champions. Their tales passed to posterity collectively in the deeds of Rostam, son of Zal, in Ferdowsi's Shahnameh, the Persian national epic. Sistan needed an urban champion who could come to terms with the Kharijits and divert them to what could legitimately be called jihad across the border, forming the gangsters into a well-disciplined loyal army. Such a man was Yagub ibn Laith, who founded the Safarid dynasty, the first purely Iranian dynasty of the Islamic era and threatened the Muslim empire with the first resurgence of Iranian independence. After the revolution in 1979, the country faced many serious issues, such as people immigrating from rural areas to big cities. It increased the flow of drugs, especially opium. It also furthered the conflict between old and new cultures and the Iran-Iraq war. The origin of counseling and psychotherapy in Iran goes back to the teachings of Zoroaster and Avesta, Zoroastrian book. After the advent of Islam extended into Iran, Muslim scientists did research in all fields, especially in human sciences, based on the teachings of Islam. The teaching of philosophy started at Tehran University, established by Dr. Siasi, who was known as the father of psychology. In Iran, the first psychological laboratory was established in 1935, whereas the first psychology textbook in the Persian language, Science of Mind, was published in 1938. A most important goal of education in this century was nurturing the learners ready to face the challenges of changing society and the complexity of the overwhelming abundance of information via the internet. Iranians are very resilient, independent, entrepreneurial, and intelligent people. Iranians have a strong tendency to resist aggression and violation of their independence. Pahlavi's dynastic pro-Western rule has shaped them relatively more in a secular fashion than most Muslims elsewhere. Irani religious leaders, however, are generally conservative and strict observers of religious rituals and traditions. Afghanistan Afghanistan has a long and intricate web of historical pasts. It is a well-known graveyard of the empires. Afghan people have gained a mix of notoriety and accolade in the historical and contemporary context. They seem to be uniquely stoic people unfazed, including psychologically, by the drastic and sustained changes of all sorts. Historically, such resilience has always been ascribed to the Jews. Afghans, however, seem to have surpassed it, manifold with flying colors. On a lighter note, Afghans might be unannounced chosen people in succession, after the Jews, then Muslims in general, and now specifically Afghans. Watch this short clip. Turkey. Turkish history extends back thousands of years before the founding of the Turkish Republic in 1923. Turks, nomadic people of Central Asian origin, established several empires, including the Seljuk Empire and later the Ottoman Empire, founded in Anatolia by Turkish ruler Osman in 1299. Empire created by Turkish tribes in Anatolia, Asia Minor, that grew to be one of the most powerful states in the world during the 15th and 16th centuries. The Ottoman period spanned over 600 years until 1922, then balkanized into several independent states through a Western conspiracy, and the remaining land was named Turkish Republic instead. At its zenith, the Ottoman Empire spanned most of southeastern Europe to the gates of Vienna, including present-day Hungary, the Balkan region, Greece, and parts of Ukraine, parts of the Middle East, now included in Iraq. At its peak between 1481 to 1566, Greece, Bulgaria, Egypt, Hungary, Macedonia, Romania, Jordan, Palestine, Lebanon, Syria, some of Arabia, and a considerable part of the North African coastal strip were part of the Ottoman Empire. Turkey has never been a colony. Turks never had to undergo psychological changes, therefore, Turks full of confidence and ready to defend their honor, country, and rights. A most recent example is the failed coup d'état of 2016, reportedly perpetrated by the USA. Greater than Hagia Sophia Mosque Religious Chauvinism? Greater than breakup of Ottoman Empire through British conspiracy. Creation of Middle Eastern sheikdoms and states. British Salon. British Brutish Raj was dominant in Asia and it remained unchallenged from 1857 until 1914 and ended in 1947. The Dominion of Ceylon, Sri Lanka, was attacked by the British in retaliation for the attack against the French Republic in 1975. The Kandyan Kingdom collaborated with the British Expeditionary Forces against the Dutch, as it had with the Dutch against the Portuguese. Once the Dutch had been evicted, their sovereignty ceded by the Treaty of Amiens, and subsequent revolts in the Low Country suppressed, the British began planning to capture the Kandyan Kingdom. 
in the 1803 and 1804 invasions of the Kandyan provinces, in the First Kandyan War, British forces were defeated by the Kandyan Sinhalese forces. In 1815, the British fomented a revolt by the Kandyan Sinhalese aristocracy against the last Kandyan monarch and marched into the uplands to depose him in the Second Kandyan War. A struggle against the colonial power began in 1817 with the Yuva Rebellion, when the aristocracy rose against British rule, in which their villagers participated. It was, however, defeated by the British. In 1848 the abortive Matale rebellion the masses were without the leadership of their native king, deposed in 1815, or their chiefs, either crushed after the Yuva rebellion or collaborating with the colonial power. The leadership in the Kandyan provinces, for the first time, therefore, passed to non-aristocrats, ordinary people. This new leadership comprised yeoman artisans, resembling the Levalers in England's civil war. The British Raj had to draw on its reserve army of labour in India to sustain the plantation economy in its lucrative new colony to the south. Through the Indian indenture system, hundreds of thousands of Tamil coolies from southern India were transported to Sri Lanka to work on European-owned cash crop plantations. These are very same people who later turned into Tamil Elam insurgents at the behest of India. Public opposition to British colonial rule continued to grow. Among the elites, there was irritation at the colour bar practised by the leading clubs. Sir Oliver Ernest Gunilk, the Civil Defence Commissioner, complained that the British commander of Ceylon, Admiral Sir Geoffrey Leighton called him a black bastard. In October 1946 a strike by the government workers and railway workers extended to the harbour and the gas company and became a general strike. The suppression was successful in breaking the strike. It was, nevertheless, set in stone that the position of the British authorities was untenable. The Bombay mutiny and other signs of unrest in the armed forces of India had already caused the British to start their retreat from that country. It finally gained independence in 1948. The Sri Lankan independence movement, a, so-called, peaceful political movement, was aimed at achieving independence and self-rule for Sri Lanka, then British Ceylon, from the British Empire. The switch of powers was generally known as the peaceful transfer of power from the British administration to Ceylon representatives. It implies considerable continuity of the colonial era that lasted 400 years in which British Ceylon remained a base of operations, particularly during the Second World War, for the Western Allies. British gave in to popular pressure and in February 1948, the country won its independence as the Dominion of Ceylon. It is deliberate historical negationism. Sri Lankans went through the usual ups and downs of history, bracing foreign rules, subjugations, and wars, a usual in the region, finally gaining independence and self-rule after 400 years. Subjugation, color segregation, suppression, etc. induced an inferiority complex in the populace. Their sustained urge for freedom and planning for it, on the other hand, however, kept their defiance intact, which awarded them with self-rule, developing comparatively more intelligently than their Indian and some other counterparts in the region. British Burma Burma, during the Second World War, was almost entirely occupied by the Japanese Imperial Army. Many Burmese fought alongside the Japanese in the initial stages of the war, but later on, the Burmese army and most Burmese switched sides in 1945. A transitional government sponsored by the British government was formed in the year after the Second World War, ultimately leading to the independence of Burma in January 1948. The Burma Campaign was a series of battles fought in the British colony of Burma. It was part of the Southeast Asian theatre of World War II and primarily involved forces of the Allies, the British Empire, and the Republic of China with support from the United States. Burmese faced the invading forces of Imperial Japan supported by the Thai Fiap Army and two collaborationist independence movements and armies, the first being the Burma Independence Army, which spearheaded the initial attacks against the country. According to the Thai military alliance with Japan signed on 21 December 1941, they agreed that from the following March, the 21st, Kareni State and the Shan States to be under Thai control and the rest of Burma under Japanese control. The initial objective of Japan was limited to capturing Rangoon, now known as Yangon, the capital and principal seaport. It would close the overland supply line to China and provide a strategic bulwark to defend Japanese gains in British Malaya and the Dutch East Indies. Japanese skepticism with regards to China's dominance seems historical. On 1 May, a Gurkha parachute battalion was dropped on Elephant Point and cleared Japanese rearguards from the mouth of the Yangon River. The next day, on the 26th, the Indian Infantry Division landed by ship. On arrival, they discovered that starting from the 22nd of April, Kimura had already ordered the evacuation of Rangoon. After the Japanese withdrawal, Yangon experienced an orgy of looting and lawlessness similar to the last days of the British in Rangoon City in 1942. In the afternoon of May, 
1945 the monsoon rains began in full force, hampering the drive of Allied forces to liberate Rangoon before the rains and succeeded, with only a few hours to spare. After the Allies captured Rangoon, a new headquarter of 12th Army was created from 33 Corps HQ to take control of the formations which were to remain in Burma. After withdrawing from Arakan and resisting 33 Corps in the Irrawaddy Valley, the Japanese 28th Army unit retreated into the Pegu Yomas, a range of low jungle-covered hills between the Irrawaddy and Sitang rivers. It planned to break out and rejoin Burma Area Army. To cover this breakout, Kimura ordered 33rd Army to mount a diversionary offensive across the Sitang, but the entire army could muster the strength of a regiment. On 3rd of July, they attacked British positions in the Sitang Bend. On July 10, however, after a battle for the completely flooded countryside, both the Japanese and the Allies withdrew. In the face of the Japanese advances, large numbers of Indians, Anglo-Indians, and Anglo-Burmese fled Burma, around 600,000 by the autumn of 1942, which was until then the largest mass migration in history. Perhaps 80,000 fleeings would die from starvation, exhaustion, and disease. Some of the worst massacres in Burma during World War II would be perpetrated not by the Japanese but by Burmese gangs linked to the Burma Independence Army. It probably was the only largest displacement and massacre before the 1947 Indian partition. The result is that Burma, for the most part, has been under army rule, dominated by the Buddhist nationalists, since 1964. Buddhist extremists, include monks, nuns, and lay people, under the guise of protection of race and religion, Ma Batha, are wreaking havoc against the minorities, especially the Muslims, for they have been seeking recognition as one of the minority groups. Buddhist government, dominated by Buddhist extremists, has introduced discriminatory and exclusionary citizenship laws declaring Rohingya Muslims non-citizens. The Japanese invasion of India in 1944 was on unrealistic premises, after the Singapore debacle and the loss of Burma in 1942, the British were supposed to defend India at all costs. A successful invasion by Japanese imperial forces would have been disastrous. The defense operations at Kohima and Impel in 1944 have acquired great symbolic value as the turning of the tide in British fortunes in the war in the East. The American historian Raymond Callahan concluded, Slim's great victory, helped the British, unlike the French, Dutch or, later, the Americans, to leave Asia with some dignity. After the war ended a combination of the pre-war agitation among the Bamar population, a majority ethnic group, for independence and the economic ruin of Burma during the four years campaign made it impossible for the former regime to be resumed. Within the next three years, both Burma and India were independent. Generally, the recovery of Burma is reckoned as a triumph for the British Indian Army and resulted in the worst defeat the Japanese armies had suffered to that date. Again, it seems like deliberate historical negationism perpetrated by historians like Raymond Callahan, above. India, Sri Lanka, and Burma are in the grip of, simmering for a long, Hindu, Buddhist religious extremism fueled by Indian Hindutva and RSS of Nataram Vinayak Godzi. Nepal. Nepal and Nepalis have been betrayed by history for far too long. A political groundswell took place in 12 years period, between 1990 and 2002. When King Varendra tried to create a prohibited zone in Kathmandu for the demonstrations, people rejected it despite curfew and shoot at sight orders. It brought down the kingdom. The Nepali word for disobedience or rejection is abhagya, whereby Nepalis defied the political parties by not listening or following their dictates. Declaring that you can give us a democracy but not peace, and we want peace first and then democracy. Such a determination is never heard, even from the people of, the developed world lest it is from rustic Nepalis. The peaceful movement of Nepalis called Jana Andolan with fewer deaths was remarkable. Another hallmark of the people movement was that, the people despite being disparate in the region, ethnicity, language, and faith came together and established national unity and collective identity and achieved the goal of peaceful democracy. It is noteworthy that the majority in Nepal consists of minorities. Nepalis also rejected the Western intervention by refusing to attend Western ambassadors managed seven-party negotiations. They also refused participation in donor-led conflict resolution meetings and shunned foreign funding for their movement, hence, taking state affairs into their own hands. Nepalis have also been on guard against the Indian intentions and interventions. Gurkha soldiers have become the face of Nepal. Nepal is a traditional underdeveloped country, with high unemployment and illiteracy with large family units. The success of the Nepali experience mainly goes to the vernacular character of its political discourse. Maldives The Maldives has been inhabited since around the 5th century BC by people coming across from, what is today, Sri Lanka and India. 
Evidence suggests early inhabitants were Buddhist but by 1153 CE, Islam was adopted across the islands when Arab interest in the region became prominent. The country is predominantly Muslim, with several mosques scattered across Mail. In addition, the Islamic Center and Sultan's Park are attractions whose beautiful architecture is particularly striking. Initially, the islands were under the suzerainty of Ceylon, now Sri Lanka. According to tradition, the Maldives converted to Islam in the year 1153 AD by a Muslim from Maghreb, Morocco, by the name of Abul Barakat Yusuf al Barbary. Abdul Barakat was a Hafiz who set about converting the local king, Sri Tribhuvana Aditya, to Islam. Due to his tireless effort and perseverance, he succeeded, and the king adopted the name, Muhammad ibn Abdullah. After the conversion of the king, the king sent missionaries to convert the local people to the various islands in the Maldives. After the conversion of the islands, Abdul Barakat stayed in the Maldives for the rest of his life. His tomb is called Medhu Ziaori and stands within the grounds of Hakuru Mosque in the capital Mail, the first Friday mosque to be built on the islands. Before Islam, the islanders were used to following the Buddhist religion since the 4th century BC. Nowadays Islam is the state religion of the Maldives, and all citizens must follow the Islamic faith. The day the Maldives embraced Islam started being celebrated, in 1374. The celebrations ended in 1387, and it wasn't until 2001 that the day Maldives embraced Islam became a national holiday. Mail was dominated by the Portuguese from around 1558 until expelled 20 years later. In the 17th century, the islands were a sultanate under the protection of the Dutch rulers of Ceylon, Sri Lanka. The British took possession of Ceylon in 1796, and the islands became a British protectorate, a status formalized in 1887. On the 26th of July 1965, the Maldives gained independence under an agreement signed with the United Kingdom. Maldives today is a presidential democracy. The Maldives is a middle-income country, which makes it a comparatively higher-income country in the region, with higher mortality and fertility rates. The population is mainly young, mostly living in rural and having basic education. Fishery and tourism are the main sources of income. Corruption is rampant and political wrangling is a norm like in any other third-world country. Bhutan Bhutan's historical period begins at about 747 AD, when the revered religious leader Guru Padma Sambhava came from Tibet and introduced Buddhism to the country. Known also as Guru Rinpoche. Although Bhutan, save some skirmishes here and there, had never been conquered and ruled by a foreign power, it had to sign two non-interference treaties, ceding its foreign policy with Britain and India, to maintain its sovereignty. Bhutan a landlocked country whose defense and foreign policy were being managed by India is, however, drifting away from the Indian sphere to that of emerging economic giant China. It is a Buddhist country due to Tibetan Buddhist monks seeking refuge and settling down in Bhutan. British East India Company as usual exploited this tiny country. Similarly, India has been roughing it up at will by choking supplies of the essentials, which made the current Bhutanese government switch its allegiance to, India's are tribal and much stronger, China. It is an agrarian country with a mainly younger population, mostly dwelling in small villages. The country is a good mix of Buddhism and Hinduism. Prohibition of proselytization most likely is the reason for no extremism in Bhutan. Shakir Mumtaz. Author, thinker, analyst. Georgia, USA.